Greetings, everyone. It's Closer Look time again. Well, a few weeks back on the uh, Multimedia Chronicles Retro, every Thursday, check it out, I presented my full archival playthrough of the original Amiga version of Out of This World, also known as Another World Overseas. I guess they changed the name here because there's a long-running soap opera in North America called Another World, and they didn't want people to think that it was based on the soap opera. So for the North American market, it was changed to Out of This World. So... Anyway, I thought it might be kind of fun to check out the original packaging. Yeah, back in the day, some of you youngins may not realize this, but uh, computer games and video games actually came in these things called boxes, and they had actual package art on them, and you could actually hold them in your hand. Yeah, pretty crazy, eh? I know, like... Who, who would have thought? Anyway, I still have my original packaging. And, well, the original... This is the actual original game that I played that you saw the archival video of from 20 plus years ago. I still have it. So I thought, hey, why not take a look at it? Check it out. I mean, games coming in actual packaging is becoming a rarer thing these days. And even the ones that you still do get a physical release tend to be kind of sparse on content. It's basically just the disc in a box, maybe a pamphlet with the instructions. You like actually you're lucky if you even get instructions nowadays. So back in the day, you would often get pretty hefty contents in the packaging. Sometimes the packaging itself was a pretty, you know, interesting and artistic affair. So this one isn't particularly packed full of stuff like some of the other ones I have, which maybe we'll look at another time. But I don't know. I just thought it might be a nice little bonus, kind of a nice little um, addendum to the playthrough video. So out of this world, the original packaging for the Amiga version today on A Closer Look. Welcome back. Now, out of this world, I don't know that I should really even bother saying that much about the game because I went into it pretty in-depth when I did uh, the voiceover for the playthrough video. So if you want a lot of information about it and a lot of stuff about the making of it and whatnot, go watch the playthrough video and uh, you'll get a wealth of information there. There's also actually a really good making of video, which I think I included in the description for the playthrough. If not, I'll include it again here in the description for this video. Uh, great stuff. It actually interviews both uh, Eric Chahi and Francois Debien, who did the music, and uh, you get a lot of their insight into um, j just what a unique and different project it was for both of them to work on. I mean, essentially, this was a one-man show. It was Eric Chahi did all of the graphics, the programming, everything himself. Um, he had already worked with Delphine Software on some other stuff, uh, most notably Future Wars, where he was a graphic designer and did a lot of the animation and stuff for it. So he had some experience with developing graphics and animation on the Amiga. And after that was released and got, uh, you know, pretty good response. I never actually played Future Wars. I, I remember hearing about it, but I, I never actually got around to playing it. Um, he essentially had a choice where he could work on Delphine's next project, or he could do his own project. He decided, of course, to do his own. And thank goodness he did, because that decision gave us out of this world. So the whole thing took several years for him to put together, I mean, being essentially a one-man show. Um, and it was released as an A-list title. This is something that is unheard of nowadays, a one-man game being released as an A-list release. That would never happen nowadays. I mean, nowadays, you look at AAA titles, I mean, the list of people that worked on it is longer than some movies. It's just crazy how many people work on, on A-list titles nowadays. But back then, we were, you know, early 90s. It was totally conceivable for someone to just make a game in their bathrobe, in their basement, and have it released and get a full, like, commercial release through a game distributor. Um, a lot of old cartridge games like back in the days of the atari 2600 and television and all those were done that way were basically just one man shows and they would get a-list releases it was a different world back then man um nowadays i mean obviously there's a lot of indie developers who essentially do the same thing but they don't release them through major companies they just kind of release them individually through steam or through the playstation store or xbox live or whatever the hell their platform of choice happens to be yeah so in a way it was kind of the end of an era because around this time we were starting to see more elaborate games with bigger teams and that trend would only continue for the next 20 plus years until well now 
So, let's not waste any more time. Let's head on down to the Black Void and we'll check out the, uh, the contents of this rather nifty packaging. Okay, so this is the North American Amiga release of Out of This Another World. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so this is the North American cover, which actually is quite a bit different from the European cover, which I'll uh, give you a look at in just a moment here. So here's the uh, spine and the top and... The other spine, just kind of get some of your system specs here. So what does this have here? So this is uh, joystick required, Amiga 500, 1000, 2000, 2500, and 3000. Supports hard disk. So yeah, so this is another, another one that was hard drive installable that was starting to become a thing in the early 90s. Uh, color monitor. Oh, kickstart versions 1.2 to 2.0 supported. Uh, 512K of memory required. No on-disk copy protection. Interesting. Well, we'll uh, we'll look at that a little more deeply in just a moment here. So if we take a look on the back, just get some screenshots. Very nice. And strangely, on the back here, it actually makes reference to the PC version. It says VGA graphics. And I was like, what? VGA graphics on the Amiga? But no, the Amiga basically had... Uh, a 32 color display typically was used. It did have other graphics modes, such as a 64 color mode and a 4096 color mode and a 16 color mode. It had a lot of different ones, but 32 seemed to be what the game uh, publishers tended to uh, prefer. Um, I guess because it was a good trade off between lots of colors and uh, speed. So there you go. So. Anyway, uh, this was actually made on the Amiga, which is why I find it kind of interesting that they talk about all the PC settings on the back. But, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. The um, the creator of the game, Eric Chahi, really liked the Amiga's graphical capabilities and animation capabilities. So um, that was his development platform of choice. The Amiga was a lot bigger in Europe than it ever was in North America. So just shows how they have way better taste than we do here. <laughs> um, yeah, as you'll see over the course of the retro videos, I was a huge fan of the Amiga, and I talk about it quite a bit. Nice, uh, sturdy box here. Yeah, good thick cardboard. Now, this is the off-disc copy protection that they were talking about. We actually have a code wheel. So at some point in the game, you would be given, um, what is it? I guess a letter and a number. So you would have to uh, point the arrow to the number on the, say, to like G. And then it would give you a letter, or sorry, uh, six. It looks like a G from up here. Anyway, uh, so say the number six, and then, okay, what symbols appear in the uh, F box? So then you'd, you'd uh, click on all the corresponding symbols to indicate that, you, yes, you own the game because you have this incredibly convoluted code wheel. If we just take a look, we give it a quick spin here, you can actually see just how many symbols are actually on this thing. It's ridiculous, like, how many are on there. Yeah, piracy was a big thing back then, and they were always trying to find clever ways to get around it. I mean, sometimes they would do stuff like this. Other times it would be like, look up a phrase in the manual. Um, or, more often than not... Uh, the discs themselves would actually use a custom proprietary bootloader that uh, would only work by putting the disc in. Now, when they started to make games hard drive installable, they couldn't do that because it needed to be recognizable by Amiga DOS and Workbench in order to be installed on the hard drive. So in this case, it, it had hard drive installation capability, so they had to be a little more creative and have an alternate means of copy protection. So... Uh, this was long before the days of PDF files and whatnot, so it was a little harder to, to crack this kind of thing. But uh, needless to say, pirates are clever, and they would find ways around those things anyway. So this one was on two discs, full of amazing polygon animation. Yes, kids, this is where the save icon came from. These were actual discs. This is what games used to come on back in the day. And then we would pop it in, click on the hard drive installation icon, and it would prompt us for the second disc when it finished loading everything from the first disc, and so on and so forth. Um, other games that we'll look at at another time uh, could be as many as 10 discs, sometimes more. <laughs> so you have to sit there putting in one disc, wait for it to load all the stuff, 
put it in the second disc, wait for it to load all the stuff, and just keep on going until it was done. Nowadays, it's just like, click the installer. Done. It's so much easier now. You kids have no idea how easy you got it. So anyway, here we got the game manual. Very nice. If we look on the back, this actually is the original artwork that was used on the cover of the European release. Uh, this is actually a painted uh, piece of art by Eric Chahi himself. He, he did this himself for the cover. He was very much a do-it-yourselfer as far as his uh, projects went. And uh, if you look him up, You'll see that he's done, he hasn't done a ton of games over the years, but they've all been like labors of love and uh, largely one-man shows. This one he did basically, it was him and a friend of his, and they did, uh, his friend did the music, and Eric Chahi did all of the other stuff. Uh, he did like rotoscoping for a lot of the animation, like we just videotape his hand doing different things and then trace it into the computer and... Um, yeah, and he just found that the Amiga was really well suited to stuff like that, so he did it all on the Amiga, and then it was later ported to other platforms. This game was a massive hit. Like, it it was just huge. Um, n nothing like it had ever been seen before. Um, if you've watched my playthrough, you'll see what I mean. I, I talk about the background of it quite a bit and just how uh, cutting edge it was at the time. Amazing cinematic stuff. And hey, look at that. I loved it so much, I actually sent in the registration card. So this game is registered to me. Amazing. I, I never got anything out of that. But uh, mind you, I did move around a lot back then too. So it's entirely possible they may have sent me something at some point. And uh, I didn't live there anymore, <laughs> wherever I was at the time. But... Uh, there you go. So anyway, very cool stuff. I, I really loved this game a lot. And uh, it was ported to countless platforms. Um, I actually also have the 3DO version of this. In fact, why don't I go grab that and I'll just give you a quick look at it. Okay, here we go. So this is the 3DO version. 3DO games came in these slightly longer boxes. Very nice. And you can see they used part of the original artwork on the cover there. And there's the spine. The 3DO is a CD-based game system that came out in the mid-90s. It uh, didn't last very long, mainly because there was a lot of competition at the time. Uh, the Sega CD came out around the same time. Uh, there was the Pioneer Laser Active. There was the Atari Jaguar. The N64 came out shortly after that. There was the uh, Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. <laughs> so there was... A ton of competing game systems there, a lot of which were from established game companies. 3DO was the new guy on the block, and uh, they just could not compete. One of the reasons being the game system itself was incredibly expensive. It was basically about 500 bucks for the system. Um, the idea was they were going to license out the technology to different manufacturers so those manufacturers would compete for your business and drive the prices down. However, only two manufacturers picked up the license, specifically Panasonic and Gold Star. So Panasonic put out a couple of models, Gold Star put out one, and that was it. And then the platform died. <laughs> Nobody wanted it, so it was just too damn expensive. I got mine on sale for 60 bucks at a clearance sale after the platform was dead. And uh, with my choice of uh, uh, like three games and an extra controller, so not too bad. So inside the case here, we just have a standard jewel case with uh, the CD inside. I think we get, uh, do we get some instructions here? Hold on a second. So we get a little uh, note here from Brian Fargo. Uh, oh, the president of Interplay Productions. So there we go. And oh, look at those lovely instructions. Yeah, sorry kid, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah. One thing I noticed about the 3DO version was, um, well, first off, the graphics are a little bit nicer. The 3DO was actually a pretty powerful system for its time. And um, I jest, there actually are instructions. Haha. <laughs> so, um, but I noticed that they jacked the difficulty level up a little bit. Um, I was never able to actually finish the 3DO version. But look at this. We actually get more of a visual instruction manual with this than we did with the... Uh, Amiga version, which is kind of nice. There you can see a picture of the 3DO controller. It was, a, it was a pretty nice controller. It actually had a headphone jack and volume control built into the controller, which is pretty cool. Um, so there you go. So they can just kind of give you a little walk through the first scene. And there you go. 
And then if you need to write down your save game passwords, they give you a sheet for that. And uh, there you go. So this one, there's a bit of a bigger list of credits for the 3DO version because, of course, they had to modify everything. But, uh, but yeah, not too bad. So this is one of many, many platforms that it came out on. There was also a Sega CD version, which is worthy of note because the Sega CD version is the only version that actually gave you the sequel. Yes, there was a sequel entitled Out of This World 2, Heart of the Alien. And Heart of the Alien essentially was a, um, a sequel slash uh, parallel story where you actually follow the adventures of his alien friend as, uh, you know, and see what he was up to and actually play as him over the course of it. Uh, now, Eric Chahi had no involvement with that sequel and uh, does not consider it canon to the main story. He considers the original to be uh, a complete story unto itself, and that is that. Now, if you want to play Out of This World or Another World for yourself, um, it's still available. In fact, on most major game consoles, you can get a digital version of it. Uh, they had like a 25th anniversary version of it that not only included the original, but also included a special enhanced version with uh, more modernized graphics. And uh, it's been re-released a number of times over the years, and it's absolutely one that you should play at least once in your life. It's just a wonderful experience, a wonderful story, and uh, really quite innovative for its time. Um, just a, an amazing cinematic game, the likes of which had never been seen before. And because it was so well done, honestly, I think it still holds up really well even today. So, uh, yeah, out of this world. Gotta love it. And there you have it. So two of the many different versions of Out of This World that have been released over the years. A funny little addendum to that, the Nintendo version. It was released on the Super Nintendo as well. And Nintendo, of course, had a pretty heavy censorship policy at the time. So you couldn't have any blood, you couldn't have any nudity, you couldn't have any religious symbols or anything like that. Like, for example, their version of Super Castlevania, they had all the crosses on the tombstones removed for the North American release. Uh, but they left them in for the Japanese release. Go figure. I don't know. A little more open-minded over there, I guess. But uh, for Out of This World, uh, there were quite a few instances of blood, either in the death scenes or in some of the, uh, you know, some of the, the creatures and whatnot had bloody fangs and whatnot. Uh, so they had to cut all that out or censor it or recolor it or something. But one of the other ones that I thought was pretty funny is... There's a scene towards the end where you're in an escape pod and you launch into the air, but it doesn't go very far. Uh, and it ends up crashing through the roof of this kind of oasis-like pool. And there's a bunch of naked female aliens sitting around enjoying the day by this pool. And then anyway, your pod comes crashing in and they all scream and scatter and swim away. Uh, but you can see some alien butt crack in, <laughs> in that scene. So apparently for the Nintendo version, that was one of the things they requested to be censored. So uh, they went in and redrew the alien butt cracks, reducing the length of the crack by three pixels. And that met Nintendo's censorship criteria. So there you go. You get a little less butt crack in the Super NES version. And that's pretty much it. As I said, uh, I, I covered most of the main stuff for Out of This World in my uh, playthrough video. So I'll include a link for that in the description as well in case you missed it when it was posted a few weeks back. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy and hope you enjoyed this closer look. Alrighty, that is it for me to you for now. So big thanks to you for watching. Big thanks to my Patreon sponsors. And I'll see you next time. Until then, sayonara. You can't see my feet in the video, so don't worry. I'm not uh, showing the world my nasty, gnarly feet in glorious high definition. <laughs> wow, that was loud. Okay. Of course, it started to get warmer, too, so I might have to take fan breaks. Greetings, everyone. Well, it's closer look time again on the Multimedia Chronicles. This week, I thought we'd take a look at... <sighs> Today on the Multimedia Chronicles. Yeah, I think we'll redo that. I think that's false advertising. That's not actually what the subject is. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to... 
Where am I? What am I doing? Uh. Welcome back. Now, out of this world, I don't know why I should... I don't know. I don't know, man. Welcome back. <laughs> Brain just immediately... Sh Fuck, it's hot in here already. Like, what happened? This might take a few takes. What else is new? Welcome back. That just sounded like, welcome back, fucking assholes. Okay, here we go. So this is the North American release of Out of This Another World. Yeah. Um, it was, of course, named Out of This World here to... Fuck, I'm going to say that in the other part. Gold Star. 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 Gold star, star gold, gold star, gold star, gold star, gold star, gold star. <laughs> gold star. Oh, tasted some smoothie there. I'll get you, Gold Star.